So we'll be talking about hepatitis E, and uh, the title is, uh, what is the issue? So I, I selected some hot topics that I think are very important for hepatitis E. And these are the topics. So um, different, uh, different points. First point is that the incidence of hepatitis E is high and is rising. Second point, uh, we have new data showing that the subtype of the virus is probably important, and there is different types of severity of the disease according to subtype. There's a risk of transmission uh, by transfusion, so that's a new risk of transmission of HEV uh, in Europe, in particularly. There are neurological disorders that are, in fact, uh, very frequent and can be severe sometimes, so that's, uh, that's something new and interesting. The treatment of acute hepatitis E uh, with ribavirin is on debate. There's probably some indications, and I'll talk to you about those. And uh, the problem with uh, treatment of chronic hepatitis E is the problem of second-line treatment. What should you do when ribavirin doesn't work in patients with chronic hepatitis E? So I'll go over those uh, different topics uh, briefly. So a little word of epidemiology, uh, just to remind you that um, Hepatitis E is the first cause of acute hepatitis in the world. It's also the first cause of acute hepatitis in Europe, and it's the first cause of acute hepatitis in France. It's uh, around 20 million cases per year, uh, 70,000 deaths per year, and there's more than 3 million symptomatic patients with acute hepatitis E, and that's just the top of the iceberg. A lot more patients are infected. In Europe, it's 2 million cases per year, and in France, it's 2,302 cases in 2016. Those are the latest data on the incidence of acute hepatitis E. But these are just the diagnosed cases. Importantly, all the cases, almost all the cases in France are autochthonous. So there, there are um, eight genotypes of uh, hepatitis E. Uh, there's um, five genotypes that can uh, infect man. Uh, genotypes one and two. Uh, strictly human, genotypes um, three and four uh, infect animals and human, and genotype seven, uh, camel and uh, humans. There, there'll be a lunch on hepatitis E tomorrow, and you'll have more data on hepatitis E during this lunch, especially the virology data. The worldwide distribution is uh, changing a little bit. Uh, so you have um, mostly genotype one in Asia and some parts of Africa. Genotype 2, Mexico, sometimes of, of Africa. Genotype 3, America and Europe. And genotype 4 is mostly um, um, Eastern Asia. And it's changing a little bit. There's more and more of genotype 1 in uh, South America. And the main genotype in uh, China now is uh, starting to be genotype 4. So there's a change in uh, genotypes. It's important to know uh, about these genotypes because different viruses uh, give different clinical m manifestations. Um, for HEV 1 and 2, uh, only humans uh, can be infected, and 3 and 4 um, zoonotic or blood supplies uh, can be uh, infected. The route of infection is uh, via infected water for genotypes 1 and 2 in developing countries, and by consumption of different types of meat, uh, mostly pork, in, uh, for genotypes 3 and 4. And you can see that blood supply is now uh, really uh, uh, known to risk of transmission for genotypes 3 and 4. There are no outbreaks for genotypes 3 and 4. And you have huge outbreaks for genotypes 1 and 2, uh, especially in Asia. You have thousands and thousands of uh, uh, patients that can be infected. The clinical attack rate is around 1 for 5 uh, for genotypes 1 and 2, and it's less than 1 for 10 for genotypes 3 and 4. So this explains that there are a lot of patients that are asymptomatic when they're infected with genotypes 3 and 4. Demographics are different. You have younger patients for genotypes 1 and 2, and older patients, typically it's a 50-year-old male for genotypes 3 and 4. There is no chronic infection described with genotypes 1 and 2. And there is a risk of chronic infection with genotypes 3 and 4, but only in immunosuppressed patients. You can have two acute hepatitis E during your lifetime, both with genotypes 1 and 2 and genotypes 3 and 4, so the antibodies are not uh, 
persistence, persistent throughout your, the patient's life. And there is a, there is a risk of neurological symptoms and sequela with uh, all types of genotypes. The cell prevalence of uh, hepatitis E in the world is uh, very different. Uh, some places you have, you have prevalence of around 12% and can be up to 50% in Nepal and Tibet. And then uh, more, more importantly, when you look in, inside a country, and this is the example for France, uh, you see that overall in France, cell prevalence is around 22%, which is, which is fairly high. But if you look in different areas in France, you have uh, some regions where the uh, cell prevalence uh, is under 8%, so this is in blood donors, and you have other places where the cell prevalence is around 80%. So this is in Ariège, uh, close to where I live. So you have really areas in France where almost everybody has been in contact with hepatitis E, so a lot of asymptomatic uh, uh, cases. This is the latest data showing the, the testing uh, for HEV and the diagnosis of HEV. So the blue line is uh, testing for HEV. So as you can see, it's going up. It's an exponential rise in testing for HEV. And the diagnosis for uh, autochthonous HEV is the red line. So you can see it just follows the, the line uh, the test of testing. So that means that uh, the doctors testing for HEV are more aware of a HEV, and they're doing more diagnosis of HEV, and that uh, induces a huge rise in HEV diagnosis uh, in France. The black line is the imported cases, and the imported cases in France are just, uh, there are very few, around 10 cases a year, and there's no rise in those cases. So the rise is with the autochthonous cases. So this, the, the conclusion of this short topic was that seroprevalence is very high, as you can see, uh, very high in some regions. Incidence is rising, and it's probably because of a better awareness of the physicians taking care of patients. Most, case, most cases go unnoticed, and this is, I think, a very important uh, data. And uh, there's a, uh, you'll see there's a role of different subtypes. So do genotypes and subtype uh, matter? It's interesting. We should think yes, of course, because it's different viruses. And there's data on HEV1 and HEV4 that there may be uh, tougher genotypes with uh, uh, more uh, diseases with more severity, but it's very hard to compare patients from different countries across the world, so I think there's no hard data on this. It's easier to compare subtypes, especially subtypes 3E and, and 3, uh, 3, excuse me, 3C and 3F. Uh, they can be compared because, for example, in Belgium, it's 50, 50%, 50% 3F, 50% uh, 3C, and in France, it's 75, 25%. So we can compare the patients. And the Belgium uh, group was, was the first to show that there was more hospitalization with genotype 3F. And uh, uh, the CNR in France, which is in Toulouse, uh, has recently showed that uh, with there's more uh, fever, the, the, the viral load is higher, uh, and there's more hospitalizations, hospitalizations with uh, HEV3F. So all this data tends to show that maybe there's more severity with uh, subtype 3F infection. And, th and this is uh, a DAG, so this is a, a complicated uh, statistical analysis, but that it shows the relationships between um, the subtype and the clinical and biological variables. For example, you can see that uh, there's a relationship between jaundice and light-colored stools, or jaundice and dark urine, so that's obvious. Uh, it's it's uh, comforting to see this relationship. But what's more interesting is that, is that there's a relationship between HEV subtype and viral load, and there's a relationship between viral load and ALT uh, enzymes. There's a relationship between HEV subtype and hospital uh, hospitalization and, and fever. So probably uh, there's, a, there's more severity with genotype 3F. So what's the risk of transfusion? So this is, this is I think, very important. Uh, th this study is the, the best study on the, on the risk of transfusion. Uh, it's an English, it's a, it's a study from England, and they tested 225,000 uh, donations with uh, mini pools, and they found that one out of 2,848 uh, donors was viremic, and, and these um, 
contaminated blood components were transfused to, to patients. And you can see that 60 uh, contaminated blood components were transfused, and there was a rate of 42% of HIV infection. So that means that when you transfuse a, a blood component that contains the virus, you have less than 50% risk of, of uh, having a, 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 um, an hepatitis, uh, inducing acute hepatitis E. And uh, most of these of the cases were fairly mild, so uh, there's debate on if you have to be, to, cons to, be, uh, uh, to check all the blood components uh, in a country. Uh, this uh, study showed that the risk factors for HIV transmission was the volume transfused, the absence of donor detectable antibody, and the high viral load, so this is uh, pretty obvious. The second data from this uh, specific article which was, the, was this one. If you have one in 2,400, uh, 48 donors that is positive for HIV. That means that uh, during one year in England, you have 80,000 to 100,000 um, people that have that have been infected with HIV. So that's huge. That shows you that the the, the, the infection rate of HIV is very important in in Europe. The data for uh, transfusion risk in the other parts of Europe is also interesting. Uh, this is uh, the recent data uh, from uh, uh, transfusion papers and uh, Toulouse paper. You can see that HIV viremia is one in six, 600 donors to one in 2,500 donors in European countries that have high endemicity. For example, in France, it's one in 800 donors, so it's, it's very high. And it's uh, one in 2,300 donors and one in 14,000 donors in European countries that have low or intermediate endemicity. And it's one in about 10,000 donors in the US. So there's different risk in different countries. So this is why uh, it's, it's totally proven that there's a risk of uh, transmission with blood transfusion. And blood donations are already screened in countries in Europe, Ireland, the UK, Netherlands, and Switzerland. And in France, HIV is detected in plasma donations using the preparation of fresh plasma. So I think we probably have to uh, go further on with the testing of blood uh, products. Now to the clinical aspect of hepatitis E, and I'll just focus on the neurological uh, risk. Um, you have an adult patient that is in contact with hepatitis E in Europe. The incubation is about 40 days, so it's like hepatitis A. And you have very, usually there's no clinical symptoms, so less than 95% of the patients will have clinical symptoms. But if they do, then there's a, about a 50% risk that they'll have a jaundice. And there is a risk of severe or fulminant hepatitis with mortality, uh, which is up to 4% in, in some uh, studies, so it's fairly high, especially in LDD patients and cirrhotic patients. And I won't have to comment on these two uh, types of uh, patients, but I'll talk about the neurological symptoms. Neurological disorders during HIV infection has been really uh, very well studied, and it's worldwide with all genotypes. So all genotypes can induce neurological disorders. Usually there are some mild liver symptoms, and there's a liver, little liver um, injury. Um, you can have a lot of different types of uh, disorders. You can have mononeuritis, which is very frequent, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, and neuralgic amyotrophy, uh, which is a personage Turner disease. In France, we call it personage Turner disease. And also, you can have meningitis. So uh, HIV can infect different uh, parts of the uh, neurological, um, uh, neurological cells. So um, the frequency of uh, neurological symptoms uh, in, a, uh, in a population of uh, acute hepatitis E has been uh, well studied recently, and it's around 16%. So this is a study where all the patients that had uh, positive uh, HIV uh, confirmed in the C uh, French CNR were called and were asked about neurological symptoms. So it's a very systematic prospective study, and that shows that the risk excuse me, the risk of neurologic disorders is actually a lot higher than we initially thought, uh, around 16%. Guillain-Barré uh, is, uh, can, 5% of Guillain-Barré syndrome are um, induced by hepatitis E. If you check a, a cohort of patients with Guillain-Barré, you'll have 5% that have acute hepatitis E. And Parsonage-Turner, neurologic amyotrophy, it's uh, 10%. So um, these are the two neurological manifestations that are really, uh, that you can really find with uh, hepatitis uh, E. Uh, 
This was a, a very nice retrospective and prospective cohort from the UK and from the Netherlands. And uh, they had uh, 47 patients with neurologic amyotrophy. They went back to the, uh, to the serums, checked for HEV, and they had a 10% uh, HEV RNA positive in this uh, cohort. So we see a lot of these patients in, as outpatients. There was a big study in Europe recently uh, uh, that was uh, coordinated by Harry Delton. Uh, seven countries, 11 centers. We took all the cases of neurologic amyotrophy. And this is interesting because it shows that neurologic amyotrophy is a little bit different when it's induced by HEV than when it's not induced by HEV. Uh, usually, when it's induced by HEV, it's asymmetrical with uh, uh, bilateral um, uh, involvement. So both, both shoulders are usually uh, touched. It's 80% versus only 8% when you, when you don't have HEV. There's often damage outside the brachial plexus, in, in particularly the phrenic uh, nerve. So problem uh, for uh, uh, these patients can have problem uh, breathing. And there's more sensor, sensory symptoms, more sensitive, uh, more pain. So this is probably, this is, indicates probably that there's a specific role of HEV in the aggression of the uh, neurologic nerves in uh, uh, neurologic amyotrophy. So when you should you look for HEV? And these are the guidelines, the EASL guidelines. Uh, so obviously, uh, because of the epidemiology data I showed you, uh, it's the first line workup for all acute hepatitis all acute viral uh, hepatitis. Uh, if you have a suspected drug-induced liver injury, you should check for HEV. Decompensated cirrhosis also. Uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome or neuralgic amyotrophy or myelitis, you should check for, systematically check for HEV infection. But also, you should check for HEV infection when you have a patient with elevated transaminitis. Sometimes it's, it's not very elevated, just a little elevation, and any type of neurological uh, manifestation. And obviously, if you have elevated transaminases after transfusion, you need to look for HEV. And what, 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 are the, what tests do you do? It's very simple. For immunocompetent patients, all you have to do is the serology. And you can check for IgMs, and they'll, they'll, tell, they'll give you the, um, the diagnosis. If you, the recommendation of the easel is to do both serology and to check for RNA uh, by PCR. What to do with chronically infected patients? So hepatitis E induces chronic infection, so in, in, in the immunosuppressed patients, this is, this is old news. And ribavirin is the treatment of choice. And this is the, the nicest study. It's a, it's a French multicenter transplant study that showed that uh, if you treat patients with uh, ribavirin, so this is 59 patients treated with ribavirin because they had chronic HIV infection and uh, uh, transplantation. Uh, the uh, efficacy is 78%. So you have almost 80% of efficacy with three months of uh, ribavirin. Monotherapy ribavirin, three months, you have 80% uh, efficacy. If you have a relapse, then you should treat these patients again for six months, and then you have 90% efficacy. So the problem is you still have between 5 and 10% of patients that will not be responders to ribavirin. The risk factors for viral relapse uh, in patients treated with ribavirin, I think they're important to know. The lymphocyte count at the start of ribavirin is important. The serum HEV uh, RNA at one month, so you're treating the patient three months, you need to check for the RNA at one month, and if it's low, then it's, uh, it's, uh, you're in good shape. The poor tolerance of ribavirin requiring dose reduction and blood transfusion, that's a new paper by uh, Nassim Kamar that shows that this is a risk factor for um, viral relapse. And the most important of all is the presence of stool RNA at M3. So if you have your patient, you, you treated him three months, you need to check for stool RNA, HEV RNA at three months. If it's positive, then you need to prolong the treatment for six months. There's no effect of, uh, on viral clearance in, this, in, the, in the latest papers on this mutation of the viral polymerase. So what, what should you do when you have patients, the 10% or 5% of patients that do not respond to ribavirin? It's a tough question. Uh, we had a lot of hopes on sofosbuvir. There's a, there were a couple of uh, in vitro essays that showed that maybe sofosbuvir would be, uh, would be a good contender, but it's not. It, it doesn't work. So our, our best hope is interferon alpha. Uh, 
And uh, this is a, an old paper. This is a paper that was before the ribavirin papers. So you can see that if you treat a patient with three months of peg, in, uh, peg interferon alpha, then you have two out of three patients that are cured of their HEV. And unfortunately, you have uh, one patient that had an acute uh, rejection. So it's tricky to treat patients that had a graft uh, uh, trans that are, are, were transplanted by interferon alpha. But th those are the guidelines of the EASAL. So you see that um, in a patient that, ha that has a chronic infection, if you, um, uh, let's see, where, if you have no HEV clearance, you do a, a three months uh, course of ribavirin. If it doesn't work, you do six months. And if that doesn't work, the recommendation is to treat the patients with PEG interferon for three months if they're liver transplant patients, because there's, the risk of rejection is less in these patients. There's no alternative available uh, in other transplant patients. So don't, don't go treating with interferon alpha patients with uh, renal grafts, for example. And I'll finish with the treatment of acute hepatitis E. And this is the, 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 the biggest study. It's a French um, uh, multicentric uh, study. We treated 21 patients with acute hepatitis E with ribavirin. So nine patients were treated because they had severe hepatitis uh, with a prothrombin index under 50%. Six patients were older patients. Four were treated with immunosuppressive drugs for autoimmune disease, and two were undergoing chemotherapy. So when I mean acute hepatitis E, uh, more than 1,000 uh, elevation of uh, transaminases. So we go for a à la carte treatment, meaning that you treat the patient you start treating the patient, and then you check for HEV RNA uh, every week. And when there's no more HEV RNA in the blood and the stools, then you can stop ribavirin. And if you do, do this type of treatment, the median treatment for these patients is 26 days. The tolerance is uh, excellent, and HEV is undetectable in a medium of 29 days. It's hard to say. There's no randomized study, so it's really hard to say if uh, there's any benefits, benefit for, for the patient. But there may be some patients that should be treated. And the guidelines of the EASL actually go, uh, go this way. Um, they say that the ribavirin treatment may be, so I guess you, know, you can interpret this as you want, considered in cases of severe acute hepatitis E or acute on chronic uh, liver failure. So that's a possibility. I think you need to discuss it with your staff and maybe experts in the field, but you may consider treatment of uh, severe acute hepatitis E. I think you should also consider treatment in very old patients. Patients are undergoing chemotherapy so that they can rid of, get rid of the virus r rapidly so that they can go on with their chemotherapy. And probably neurological symptoms. If you have a patient with a neurologic amyotrophy and you have viral RNA in the blood, then you ha I think you should treat them because uh, this is a really a, a tough disease. Obviously, in all cases, you need to make sure that you have HEV detectable in the serum, so you need to be in contact with a, a lab that does HEV RNA in the blood. So my conclusion is that HEV infection diagnosis is rising, so in France, in Europe, everywhere. Subtype F, subtype 3F may be more severe, so this is new data, interesting data. Neurological symptoms are frequent. And neurologic amyotrophy is really the, the one uh, symptom that you should uh, look for. Ripavirin treatment may be considered in cases of severe acute hepatitis E, and, and I add including neurological symptoms, or acute on chronic liver failure. And chronic hepatitis E is treated with three months of ribavirin, and three more months if the uh, stools are positive after three months. And in case of relapse, you go for a six-month treatment of ribavirin. And if all this fails, then you have interferon therapy that can eventually be used in combination with ribavirin in liver transplant patients, and definitely very easy to use in hematological malignancies and AIDS, treat, uh, AIDS patients. We don't see AIDS patients very frequently anymore, but if they have a very low uh, very uh, severe immunosuppression. They have chronic hepatitis C, and you can treat them with, uh, with interferon alpha. It's, it's easier than with ribavirin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wait, no questions? I think just one comment. Why don't we use the vaccine for hepatitis E? I, I know you've given an excellent clinical talk, yep. 
But this is a disease that varies globally. In the refugee camps, the townships, the mortality amongst pregnant women is high. Yes. We have a vaccine. Why is it being used? The, the vac vaccine is a China, uh, Chinese vaccine. It's used in China, and it's, it's used nowhere else. In, in Europe, we tried to get the vaccine with uh, Harry Delton. We're trying to do studies in cirrhotic patients, for example, that should be uh, 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 treated with vaccine, and it's, it's impossible to get. It's a shame because it works on all genotypes.